So like we said, I'll talk about but also the things, just the experience, you know, growing up, going to medical school, how I landed where I am, and the things that sort of helped me and the things that um, uh, did not help me along the way. So um, I'm just going to throw it all the way back to right from growing up, um, growing up in a family of um, six, we were six kids. Uh, my parents were... Um, they were scientists, so to say. My dad studied engineering, mom was a doctor. So I grew up in an environment that was very um, science inclined. So as um, as little as five years old, I knew things like in petigo, you know, rigomotis. I didn't know, of course, the, the physiology and uh, pathophysiology and co, but I knew there were diseases like that and I had seen it like in Petaigo, you know, and then, you know, maybe when we're dressing a chicken and somebody will say, my mom will say, oh, it's having rigomotis, allow it to, <laughs> you know, um, that's why it's sort of frozen. So I was picking up things like that along the way. So somehow going on into secondary school, you know how it is, I think it's still like that in Nigeria. If you're doing very well in the sciences, you know, somehow you get pushed to the pure sciences, and that was the case for me. I, I was doing very well in the sciences. I, I was put in the science classes. I did very well. So when it came time for um, university education, um, there were two options, either medicine or engineering. And I wasn't going to touch engineering because I hated for that much. So um, it became medicine by default for me because I didn't know what else to, to you know, what other course to take. I didn't really have that benefit of um, having somebody counsel me on what other options were out there. I didn't even know what other options were out there. But in my mind, I just felt like I needed a challenge. I'm always somebody who is up for a challenge, you know, and I felt that medicine would give me that challenge. And if I had taken any other thing, maybe um, it would have just been a bit too easy for me. And of course, there was the influence also from my parents and the society as well. Everybody is sort of expecting you to go into medicine. So um, I filled medicine in my jump. And um, after the first, I took my first jump, I had a very good score. I thought it was good enough, but it didn't get me in. And by the time I realized it wouldn't get me in, it was too late, so I lost a year. I took another exam. This time I was even lower, I scored some marks lower than the first disappointed from the start. And my parents had to start looking for options at that point to see how I could get into school. I was offered some other courses. I, I, I rejected. So um, luckily for me, my, my elder sister was in um, the University of Lagos. She was also studying medicine. So my dad came to Lagos, went to see the vice chancellor, and somehow um, the vice chancellor told him, oh, your daughter didn't pick University of Lagos, and it's really very competitive. She can't get in, you know. Um, but then he gave him an option. He told him about the Unilag diploma, and my dad got a form for me. He came back. He told me, oh, see, it's only English and maths. That's the entrance exam. We're going to pass it. And then I looked at English and maths. It was further mathematics. The same thing I was trying to run away from. So I had to buckle down, you know. And I, I, I within the space of two months or so, luckily for me, my dad is, he was a teacher at some point uh, in his career before he became an engineer. So he taught me further maths. And I was... Um, I was lucky enough or blessed enough to pass the entrance examination. And that was how I got into medicine. Um, now, while I was running the diploma program, um, I was staying with my sister who was in the College of Medicine. So I was privileged to um, have that exposure to the medical students, how their life is, you know, they come back from lectures and from clinical postings, they're talking about school, about their experiences with the consultants, the, the residents, et cetera. So uh, believe it or not, towards the end of my diploma year, I wasn't actually sure I wanted to continue with medicine, just having seen what it was like from the student aspects of the life, of the, of the medical life. 
So I was having doubts at that point, but I couldn't talk about it to anybody. I couldn't, I couldn't really, um, I didn't have the courage to tell my parents that I was having um, doubts because I had already lost a year trying to get into medicine and then they got me into diploma after paying some hundreds of thousands and then, you know, it would have been crazy. So at a point I was almost praying not to pass my examinations, but of course that didn't happen. So um, that was how I came into the uh, College of Medicine, you know, was going through the, the different years. While I was there, I knew I didn't want to practice in the clinic. So I was just always on the lookout for an option. I was thinking, oh, maybe I'll do public health, you know. So I, I just went through the motions, went through school, putting in my best. Of course, I didn't want to have to, you know, um, drop out, that sort of thing. So but I put in my best. While I was in school, also, I was engaging in um, extracurricular activities. Um, I had started playing tennis um, at a young age. So I joined the tennis club in school back then, and I actually won two of their tournaments. Um, because I was interested in sports, I also ran for uh, AMSU Sports Secretary. That's the Association of Medical Students of so the University of Lagos. So I was actually their sports secretary for a year in 2007 as well. So all these activities, they helped to sort of also give me other perspectives aside from the medical books and the medical lectures. And also, most importantly, I, I dabbled into modeling. I spent a bit of time, my spare time then, I did a lot of um, runway modeling. Um, I did some photography, and I also participated, uh, participated in a couple of pageants, of which I actually won one. Um, I won the Miss Emo pageant in 2008. By then, I was in my 400 level. And um, so that took me a lot away from school. I had times when I had to, you know, travel back home to Imo states because uh, by right of my position, I had to be present um, for certain activities. Um, so it took me away from school a lot. Sometimes I missed lectures, you know, and um, I think 500 level while I was still doing this, um, was the first time, first and only time I had a receipt. I think it was in ONG. You know, I was <laughs> I was devastated. But looking back now, I think it was I think it was worth it because I mean there's an opportunity cost usually for everything, every decision that we make. And the kind of exposure that I got back then through all the activities I was involved in, both in school and outside school, it sort of shaped me and um, made me to further understand or further solidify my um, my resolve not to be in the clinic. So um, finishing school, um, I had my internship in um, Lutz as well. It was one of the most intense years of my life. I mean, I think almost everybody here has graduated. I think there's only one student here. It was really intense. Um, the week I resumed housemanship, I think that week I, I had a back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back call. I was I was at work for almost five days at a stretch. So it was like it was like a baptism of fire for me, you know. But it was also fun because then we started. Um, that was when you know you start earning your own money, and it wasn't small money back then. It was really big. You know, start any your own money, living like a worker, you know, getting more into the realities of um, life after school. So it was also exciting. Uh, but then there, there were other challenges. I mean, everybody knows the system that we are operating, the lack of um, health insurance for patients, um, people living below poverty line who need access to care. A lot of times being in the a and &E, then I, I, we had to donate money for patients, you know. So we also had, I also had those kind of experiences that were a bit um, discouraging for me. Um, so um, 
after my after my housemanship, I was certain, I was 100% certain that I didn't want a clinical career. But then, unfortunately for me, I also did not know what I wanted. I didn't know what I wanted. I just didn't want clinicals. Uh, um, which is why I really like what Olakumi is doing because I think if I had had the opportunity to, you know, interact with people in the health space who were doing other things outside the clinic, it would have helped me to um, sort of be more focused in, you know, targeting my um, energy towards a particular direction of growth. So I finished house my I still didn't know what I wanted. I went on to um, NYSC. NYSC, uh, because I didn't know what I wanted, I, I think I was really very wasteful with time. I had a lot of time on my hand that when I think back, I, I didn't really use it for anything. Um, I didn't really use it for anything that was um, that would have really benefited me in my career. I could have spent time you know, trying to learn skills. There are certain skills I'm learning now. I could have learned them. I had the resources. I just didn't have the direction. I had the resources. I had laptop. I could get access to data, but I, I didn't learn basic things like Excel. Even um, then, I, I learned XPSS though, but I only learned enough to be able to use it for my um, project work in school, and then I didn't bother with it again. So I didn't have any mentoring, so to say. I had no direction, and I was just there, was just like um, a talent that was not being put to use. So um, after NYSC, Time for the uh, the real life, you know. No more, no more. Um, what do you call it? Allowing. There was nothing, and I was just there. No job. I mean, there were offers for locum, but I had made a resolve not to pick up an offer because, and I I thank my sister for this because she sort of um, supported me. She told me if you get sucked in, it's difficult to get out. So don't even be tempted, don't get in, don't do residency. If it starts, you probably don't want to stop until you are done, you get sucked in, into the system. So, um, I mean, there was a lot of pressure from my parents. My parents pressured me. Um, I ended up bowing to their pressure. I took um, radiology primaries. I took the radiology primaries, you know, they were still pressuring me, oh, go and apply to this place, apply to that place. I never did anyway. But I didn't tell them. I just told them, oh, uh, they've not started calling for applications. But I just didn't, but I didn't know and I didn't care to find out. So that's the one thing I had going for me. My sister, I had somebody who was supporting me in my decision to not um, practice in the clinic. You know. So one of the challenges I had during that time was that because um, because I didn't really have any soft skills, I couldn't really... I hadn't bothered to develop soft skills. Unfortunately, the way the medical um, school in Nigeria is programmed, we don't really get that opportunity to develop certain skills that we can use in other situations outside the clinic. So a lot of focus, 90% of the time, is on clinical skills. Meanwhile, there are other things, other avenues that you can use to develop yourself within the school. And those opportunities were there, but I just didn't really see them. Like when you'd be asked to do a presentation for your class, um, maybe you have a case, you're presenting a case, that's actually an opportunity for self-development, for you know, learning how to do PowerPoint slides, you know, doing an, uh, a presentation effectively, holding your audience, but I didn't really see that. The emphasis wasn't on the scale of presentation, more on the information that you had to offer, the clinical aspect of the knowledge you had to share. So um, I lacked a lot of skills, you know, and so because of that, I was sort of afraid. I didn't really have that confidence to go out there and, you know, just get a job. It was scary. It was scary, but just because I knew I didn't want to be in the clinic, I, I had to you know, hold on onto my resolve. Now, during that period, the first couple of months after NYC, I was unemployed, I didn't have a job. But then um, 
a friend of mine called me one day and said, oh, uh, my head, a HMO is, um, is hiring. They're looking for a doctor to work in their claims department. I think she go put in an application. And I did. I did, um, some other people did, a couple of people from my class as well did, some seniors did, and um, on the day of the interview, I found myself there. Now, one thing I want you to pick from this, the, the job description has specifically requested for a master's degree holder with two years experience. I, I didn't have any experience at all. I didn't have a master's degree, but I just resolved to do my best, um, put in my application, you know, uh, put my best foot forward and see what comes out of it. And that was exactly what I did when I went for the interview. I saw some other people. I saw, I saw even a classmate of my sister's, you know, she had just finished her MPH and stuff. So I was already feeling like, um, oh, you won't get the job. But surprisingly, I did. And some of the key tricks that basic tricks that I have for interviews, when you go into an interview, you know, try to look at your interviewers in the face, smile at them, and most of all, be relaxed and honest. And, and this was exactly what I did. I remember I was asked the question, there was a question they asked, I couldn't figure it out. I said, I'm sorry, I don't, have, I don't know the answer to that one. So I was plain. I didn't try to falsify information or that sort of thing. So... I think that sort of worked in my favor and I got the job. So, but while I was working there, it was okay for a while, but then it got boring to me. I was doing basically the same thing day in, day out, you know, same thing day in, day out. And um, it was boring. I, I'm, I'm the kind of person that I need, I need to be stimulated. Um, every day by new challenges. I don't want to be doing the same thing every day, every single day, the same thing. And it's worse if you're working in an organization where there's really not much room for, um, there's, no, there's little room for innovative thinking. Like it's not really encouraged. And even if you have it and you express it, it's overlooked, that sort of thing. So I started looking for um, alternatives as well. Another thing I should point out here, at this point where I took this job, uh, it was like a 35% cut from my salary, my salary as a house officer, but I didn't mind because I just needed to get out there, see what the options are out there, you know, test my foot in the waters, um, and prove myself, prove myself. And uh, I knew that if I put myself anywhere, I will probably get promoted and, you know, get the money that comes with it. So money was not the focus for me. Rather, I just wanted to get out there and learn. I knew I did not have skills, but I was willing to learn. So um, at that point where it was becoming very routine, I started looking for options. I decided I was, I was um, making applications also at this time. I was making applications to different places. And, you know, people always, I don't know why people, <laughs> people always have this, you know, they ask, oh, yeah, doctor, why are you looking for a job here? I see if uh, doctors cannot work anywhere. Doctors can work anywhere. And this is something I like to tell um, any medical students or anybody who has passed through the system. Don't ever be afraid. If you can pass through medical school, you can do anything, anything whatsoever you put your mind to. If you're able to put in half the effort you put in medical school, then you are going to excel outside medicine. So um, while I was still looking for jobs, I decided that maybe, just maybe, what I need to do was to upskill myself um, to get more a better foundation. And I decided to go to business school. Um, once I had decided that that was the thing, I started looking for schools. Um, I didn't want to go to the U.S. because U.S. was going to be two years of school. I didn't want to give two years of my life again after medical school to school. And uh, I was being lazy, I guess. I also didn't want to ride the GMAT. So I decided on the U.K. Um, so guys, if at any time you have any questions or any comments, you can just drop it in the chat box. So um, 
in choosing a business school, I had to look at different options. Business schools are typically very expensive. Um, I wanted to go to the UK. I didn't want to you know, be bankrupted for life because I wanted to go to business school. So I had to tailor my choices down. I had to create a balance between what was affordable and what was, what was going to give me what I wanted knowledge-wise and exposure-wise. And so that was how I settled on the University of Bradford. And this was because um, it was triple accredited as a, as a business school, and that's the highest accreditation you can have. But it was also in a town that was not in a very big um, metropolis. So standard um, cost of living was going to be cheaper and the school fees were more reasonable. Then I think the school fee was, um, I think it was about 23,000 pounds or something. I didn't have that money, but I just knew this is what I wanted. This is where I want to go to and I, I want to do it now. So. At the point, after I had done my application and everything, gone through all the processes, written their English exam and all that, I got, um, I got an offer for admission. So um, that was one hurdle crossed. Um, the next was, where do I find the money? I didn't have the money. I didn't have the money. So what I did was I buckled down. I, I just did a mail to the school. Uh, one thing about business schools is that they, they take part of the part of the experience of being in a business school is um, the diversity of the students that you have there. So every business school wants to have people from different backgrounds. They want blacks, whites, um, Asians. They want people from different um, uh, uh, different specialties, you know. And it's not very typical that they see doctors, you know. So. I did them a, a mail, you know, just saying, oh, I've gotten this opportunity from you. I appreciate it. Um, but now I have this challenge. I, I, would, I would need some help with funding, you know. I just put together a case for them and I sent the mail. And believe it or not, within the next two days, I got a response. I had gotten, I think it was about 40% um, um, discounts on my school fees. I was shocked because I had never really, I'm not a very pushy person. I had never done that and I'd never pushed back, you know, and that taught me a lesson that I have never forgotten. Always ask for more, whether you're at a negotiating table or wherever, always ask for more. The worst that can happen is that um, you'll be told, no, it won't change anything. It won't change anything but you could also get what you asked for and i mean what could be better than that so that taught me a lesson and um i i was able to raise my school fees and everything i went to school now uh, going to the mba one of the things that we did at school was called um, personal development planning and um, that's something that really made an impact in me personal development planning simply means you Evaluating yourself, look at yourself. What are the things that you lack? What are the things that you lack? What are the skills that you lack? What are the things that scare you the most, but you know that you need it? You know? So a self-evaluation to discover your weak points and those things that you need to build, those skills that you need to develop. And then you pick out about three of those skills and um, you take them, draw up a plan of action on how to address them over the course of the year. What are the activities you're going to be doing in order to build um, skills um, necessary to overcome those weak points. And then you keep a diary to um, take note of, um, of your progress. So that was one cause that really made an impact in me because it helped me to overcome um, a lot of things a lot of help me to, you know, get stronger in the areas that I was weak in. And that's something that I always advise other people to also do. Don't run away from your weak points. Acknowledge them, then work on them. Have a plan, work on them, stick, your, stick to your plan, and definitely you find um, improvements. You see improvements over time. So, um, having finished my MBA, while going to the MBA, I had, I think I had a lot of um, insecurities coming from 
the medical background, every other person that was in school then, they were in different fields, you know, people who had been in management, they had a lot of experience. I Me, mean, I didn't have that much experience, just house job and one year of um, working in, in claims in, in a HMO. Mm -hmm. you know. So I I had I had this insecurity that I didn't really maybe I wasn't gonna make it through the through the through the business school um, session. So that made me to really buckle down and put in my best. Um, and at the end of the year, I actually got the best graduating student award. But that came at a cost because when I look back, I realized that um, I didn't network as I should have. Uh, part of the things that one should do at every point in your life, even as a student, as a doctor, wherever you are working, wherever you are, network. You must try to get to know people. You must try to connect with people. And um, it's not about being friends with them, just discuss with them trying to understand what they do you know i didn't really i think that suffered that aspect suffered for me in business school so if i were to turn back the hands of time that's something i would try to do better uh, for myself so um finishing business school i came back to nigeria um applications left right center i think i sent more than 100 applications but to companies here and also companies in, in um, the UK as well. Um, but I didn't get anything on time and it was getting quite depressing. Then one day somebody called me. It was um, somebody from the previous HMO I worked in. Um, so I was set up for an interview. Another HMO was recruiting and I went for the interview. Now, uh, now at this point, it was for a managerial role, still in claims, but managing um, the claims team. So I got in. I got in, but um, while there, it was still the same thing for me. It was more of um, just trying to get something doing while waiting for that one thing to click. And believe it or not, at this point, I still didn't know what I wanted. I still hadn't found exactly what I wanted. So, but I was always on the lookout and I knew that when, when I see it, I would know. So um, I worked in this company as the claims manager, managing the, the, the team that's, um, that's um, handled the claims coming in from the hospitals. And one thing I'd like to point out from my experience working in HMOs is that obviously, a medical school needs to evolve beyond what it is now because what I saw was that a lot of hospitals that were run by doctors, they were not really doing well. And for a very basic reasons, they were not really doing well. So we get claims from these hospitals, we work on the claims and um, we send the claims um, to be processed and paid to the hospitals. So a lot of times for the same reasons um, the hospital's claims will be denied. So the hospitals were actually losing money, but they were not doing anything about it. And month in, month out, they will send the same bills, they'll make the same mistakes, and they'll lose money. And so it was mind-boggling to me how people could run businesses that way. And the common denominator I saw is that a lot of the hospitals were run by doctors, and I could only link it to the lack of um, basic business knowledge from medical school. So um, while I was still working in the same place, um, I was still on the lookout for the EAT job. One day a friend of mine sent um, a job description that, oh, this company, this company is, um, this company is looking for somebody, they are a new company, they're looking for somebody in Nigeria. And I just looked through the, I looked through the job description. It looked really different from anything I had seen. It was going to be totally different. This was M Pharma, and this was when they were doing, uh, when we were doing our e-prescription um, business model, where there was a software. They had a software then that was going to be given to doctors to make prescriptions, and doctors would be able to see 
pharmacy networks around and also see the inventory being held by the pharmacy networks, you know, and be able to direct prescriptions to either a pharmacy close to the patients, either where the patient works or which, where the patient lives that has that inventory in stock. So it was, it sounded really exciting. Um, I got called for the interview. I spoke to the, my interviewer, the CEO then, and it was really inspiring. It was really inspiring. At, at that time, the, the the CEO of M Pharma was, I think it was just about 24 years, 24, 25 years. And it was just amazing because he had this um, brilliant ideas and it was as if I had found what I was looking for. And um, uh, luckily for me and luckily for them as well, I got, um, I got taken for that role. And that was how I got into M Pharma and got into the pharmaceutical industry. Now, uh, at that point, M Pharma was not really playing in the pharmaceutical industry because we were more of health tech. We we're more of health tech. And, um, but along the way, the business model was pivoted because we saw that there were gaps that we could further fill. And that was how we you know, went fully into the pharmaceutical industry, into distribution. So currently, M Pharma does a lot of um, distribution of um, drugs and diagnostic equipment, PCR equipment, and uh, consumables. So um, in my role then at M Pharma, I was a hospital engagement manager. And basically, what I had to do on a day-to-day -day was reach out to um, decision makers in hospitals and try to get them to buy into the vision of M Pharma, to buy into our products. We had an innovative business model, which is called the vendor managed inventory model, where we could give drugs to the hospitals and they didn't have to pay until they actually dispense the drugs to the patients. So it was something new. So it was a big challenge, you know, breaking it in into the market. A lot of people didn't really understand how it could work. You know, but with technology, we're able to make it happen. Now, um, this role that I had then, it was a customer facing role. So it was basically sales and business development. And um, it was a bit of a challenge for me initially because uh, I think my personality, I'm a bit, I can be a bit of an introvert, but I had to get out there and deliver because the company was depending on me. It was my role and nobody else was going to do it. So I dived in there and had to do my thing. I had to go through different channels to get through to the people uh, that were my targets. I had to you know, leverage on um, my network, referrals from people who are already in the business with us, referrals from um, people within my own professional network, linking me to doctors, who had hospitals or people, key decision makers in hospitals. I did a lot of field work. It was, it was initially it was a big challenge, but then I really got into the flow. You know, uh, the, the cold calls really could be challenging. Cold calls where you just, you know, just drive up to a hospital and you are trying to see the CEO or the CMD or whoever, the medical director in charge of the hospital. You know, it was fun. Sometimes you get rejected. Other times, you know, you find your way in. And over time, you know, over time, I developed my own way of getting what I wanted. And it was more, it was more fun for me to work. And over time, I also developed that um, instinct. You know, when you're talking to clients or to potential partners, within the first five, 10 minutes of speaking to them, Already, I can tell if they would be good business partners, if they would be interested in what I'm saying. And even if they're interested, are they going to buy into it? And uh, are, going to, are they going to buy into, into it fully? And even if they do buy into it, are they going to be difficult um, clients to, to handle? So those were the kind of skills that I developed over time. Um, for which I am, I am grateful because it helped to, I think I tell people in, in, being, in being an introvert does not stop you from doing um, a customer facing role.
from holding a customer servicing role. You can do it if you want to, and that shouldn't stop you, you know. And I think that really helped me, you know, being at that point in my career where this is what I want to do, this is what I wanted to do. The passion helped me also to overcome that fear, that challenge of being an introvert and not liking to spend so much energy talking to new people, basically. So um, over time, M Pharma, M Pharma continued to grow. When, when I started in M Pharma, I think we were just three, we were just three staff, um, three pioneer staff that started the company in Nigeria. Now I think we're over 100. So there's been a lot of growth. And um, part of what keeps me going within the company is that it's a place where innovation is encouraged. In fact, it's um, a prerequisite to being employed in Enfama. You have to be an innovative thinker. You have to think on your feet. You have to be um, a creative problem solver. You actually encourage to come up with your own ideas about how problems should be solved. You know, so so that keeps me going. And currently in M Pharma, um, I said we do a lot of distribution, but recently M Pharma has moved to develop a business for um, a B two C business where we have a unit that interfaces directly with patients, and that's the unit that I had, which is the multi unit. I'm sure, I'm sure people were wondering what is multi. I always have to explain what multi is. So MUTI is Enfama's business unit that interfaces directly with patients. And it was formed because we realized that we had a lot of um, signages that we are not getting, that we could leverage on to get more access to patients, you know, get them to have more access to healthcare, um, either by reducing cost of drugs or giving them other kinds of support. Well, we couldn't do that because we didn't have any formal business unit or brand set up for that purpose. So um, the Muti, Muti brand was born. And currently in Muti, we have, we have several things going on. We have um, a delivery pharmacy. We have delivery pharmacies that deliver drugs directly to patients everywhere in Lagos, um, Port Harcourt and Abuja. Um, that's one aspect of what we do. We have um, we have a unit that engages directly with um, doctors in hospitals and in their different practices and lets them know what we have to offer on MUTI. Um, we interface directly with uh, pharma partners. We have partnerships with the likes of um, global manufacturers like Pfizer, Novartis, Roche, and Co. And we have what we call patient support programs um, that we work on together with um, these companies. Now, these patient support programs are special programs that are, well, we do in partnership with manufacturing companies. And the aim is to provide increased access for patients who cannot normally afford um, healthcare access or the aim could also be to provide non-clinical or non-doctor support to these patients. And that's where we call that a disease management program. I'm going to give certain examples just to, because I know this is quite new. Um, so I'm going to just sort of describe a couple of our programs. I get an idea of what we are doing. Okay, so for some of our, some of our patient support programs, we have those that are primarily financial. And what that means is that um, we have an agreement with the manufacturing company where they provide discounts and that discount must go directly to the patients who need those drugs. And what that means is that those drugs cannot be sold um, to wholesalers, it can be sold to hospitals because the pharma company wants the drugs to get to that patient at a certain price. Now, what most people don't know is that in the pharma industry, when drugs are produced, uh, let's say for instance, um, company X produces a, a, a brand of Panadol. They produce it at three naira, they give it to the distributor at maybe 3.5 or four naira. By the time that drug gets to the patient, that drug is being sold for 12 naira. 
So it's a huge challenge for the pharma companies because what happens is that a lot of the patients who normally, if, if that drug had gotten to patients at five naira, maybe 100 patients can have access to the drug. But the drug is getting to patients at um, 12 naira, and then only 10 people can afford it. So um, it's not something that pharma companies like, and that is where Muti comes in because it's a direct to patient uh, business model. So what we do with these pharma companies, they partner with us for patients who need this medication, they can come directly to, to, to us for the, for the drugs and get access to um, very good prices. And so that drug that they could have bought for 12 naira, maybe when they come to Muti, they can get it for six naira. So that's the kind of service, um, financial patient support um, program that we have. And currently we have that running for certain high value medications. For instance, Merunem. Merunem is available on Muti for as much as um, 50 to 60% discounts. And another thing, another very innovative thing about the multi business units um, is that patients are allowed to make what we call fixed payments. So imagine a patient is um, in the ICU or it's in um, high dependency units in the ward and they need Merrill name, their salary earner, they just use all their money to spend on uh, investigations and whatnot. And, but they need Merrill them to survive, but they just don't have money at that point in time. So the multi program also gives them access to um, fixed payments. And what that means is that let's say Meronem costs, the cost of Meronem on multi, I think is about, um, I'm not sure, it's cheaper about 70,000 compared to about 160,000 on the, on the general market. So if a patient who is on multi needs that medication, they get access to that medication if they had only, um, let's say they had only 35,000, Muti allows them to make a deposit and get access to that drug so that they don't deteriorate for that and they don't die. So Muti gives patients access to the medications when they need it. And then the patient gets a further 30 days to make payments. Uh, to make the balance of the payments of the drug. And the good thing about it is that the cost of the drug does not change because the patient needs to make fixed payments. Patients still pays the same amount they would have paid if they had a complete, um, they had a complete money for the, for the medication. So those are the kinds of um, financial support that we provide. We also have a program for diabetic patients where but we provide non-clinical support. It's called a disease management program. So we know that typically doctors are very busy people. A diabetic patient goes to a doctor, maybe gets only 10, 15 minutes with a doctor after waiting several hours in the clinic. They go home. A lot of these patients are um, not very enlightened when it comes to their disease, um, comes to their disease, um, the disease that they're suffering from. They don't really understand why they have the disease, they don't understand how they can manage it so that they can live better lives. So we have a disease management program for diabetes where patients can call us, they can enroll on the program. Um, this is also in partnership, like I said, with um, a pharmaceutical company. So the patient calls us, they get enrolled on the program. We have um, coach nurses who talk them through um, the disease management diet um, modifications that you need to do, lifestyle modifications, exercising, uh, you know, teaches them about their um, blood sugar levels, taking how to use their um, insulins, proper administration of their insulins, how to use their glucometers to test their blood sugar levels every day, and also to understand what the blood sugar levels mean. So if it's high, they know that it's high and they know what to do. If it's low, they know that it's low, they know what to do. So um, that is the kind of support that we provide. And so far we've seen a lot of, um, we've seen not just traction in numbers of people enrolling, we've also seen improvements of over 80% um, of the patients who joined the program had actually improved in their blood glycemic levels over time. 
So you see, that is a disease management program, and those are the kind of initiatives that we have ongoing um, within the multi-business unit. And that is one of the things, um, that's one of the reasons why I have stayed so long in Enflama. People ask me, why, what are you still in Enflama after five years? And the only answer I can give is the innovativeness of what we do, you know, the, the, the opportunity to be innovative in problem solving, in solving the problems that we see in our environment. Um, so basically that's, um, I think that's it really. Uh, I'm not sure if I've covered everything. Um, Olakumi, if there's anything you'd like me to speak on specifically, then please let me know. And guys, um, feel free to ask questions as well. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Oguna. Um, that was actually very detailed. Um, I don't think I have any specific thing I would have wanted you to talk about. I think you pretty much covered everything. So I think now we're going into the question and answer session. So I would like for um, everybody in attendance, if you have any question, can you please maybe um, signify by raising your hand so we can take it in an orderly fashion. So any question either as related to a career journey that she shared or possibly maybe um, she may want to, she may be able to answer some questions on Enfama as well or other um, aspects. And she also just puts up a LinkedIn profile. So I guess um, people can also reach out so after, but if you want, if you have any questions at the moment, um, does anybody? Okay. All right, Ibrahim, can you unmute please and ask your question? Thank you, Kumi, and thank you so much, Dr. Ogona. Um, very detailed uh, account of your story, your journey so far. Um, I, my question is, um, it's about like, so far you've been working in uh, pharma now, in, in pharma for maybe five years, you've worked in other places before then. Um, are there times that you, like for many people who practice or who study medicine, there's just this pull every now and then where you feel, oh my God, um, did I make a mistake? Shall I be practicing med medicine instead? Or shall I not have stopped practicing medicine? Does that ever come up for you? And if it does, how do you deal with that? Thank you. To be honest, I have never regretted. I have never re regretted not practicing. And when you look at it, I, I, I tell myself, this is some kind of practice that I'm doing as well, because what, what's the work I do provides support for the doctors in the clinics. You know, it has a lot um, of impact as well for patients beyond um, just seeing them within the clinic. And the impact is not just for patients, but also for doctors, because what I do um, helps patients in their outcomes, increases care, uh, access to care for everybody. And I think the doctors really are also happy when their patients are able to get better. So um, the only thing, I think when I left medicine over time, I stopped um, sort of updating my knowledge. And that's one thing that I regret. I was just going for CPD points just so that I could just you know, have my license renewed. I wasn't really paying attention. So um, that is my only regret. So if anybody is to um, move away from the clinic, try and stay updated, you know, find a way to stay updated so that you don't totally lose touch. It's still um, of immense help even outside the clinic to have up-to-date um, clinical knowledge. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Agrona. Uh, Ibrahim, you said you had a second question. Um, I was going to wait and let others ask your question and maybe I can go ahead and ask that, but thank you. Okay. All right. Um, all right, so um, just calling me question in the chat box. Um, she's asking about the accreditations you mentioned for the business schools. You said it had the highest accreditation for business schools. I think she's asking what's the accreditation in. Yeah, can you hear me? Okay, so um, typically, um, you know the same way that medical schools are accredited, business schools also have their own accreditation bodies. And um, what I meant by the accreditation there are, there are three bodies that accredit business schools. So typically some business schools will have one or they might have the other one, but there are some that are called um, triple crowned, meaning that they have accreditation for the three um, bodies that accredit business schools. And um, I'm just going to type the names of, um, of the accreditation. Um, so the Ekis and the Amber, and there's actually a third one. And for some reason, I just can't recall it right now. Let me try Google. <laughs> uh, so usually there are three bodies that accredit the business schools. So once I once I I get the third one, I will I'll put it in the chat box for you. For some reason I just can't recall. I think it might be old age. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Um I kind of have a question of my own which is, I think it's as regards, I'll probably say as regards um, getting postgraduate um, qualifications. So I know you mentioned initially that you got a job um, that had MPH uh, applicants as well, but you ended up getting it without an MPH. And then you ended up going out to do your uh, master's later on. Um, I think the question I kind of had is as regards funding, really, because I think for a good number of us, getting funding for a foreign, in particular, foreign, foreign postgraduate education, it's usually kind of difficult. Like either, okay, you can't pay personally and then maybe you're applying to funding and you're not getting, maybe you, you, you can get like a discount, but you're not getting as much as you want. So there's then the alternative of, oh, do you just stay back in Nigeria and go to a local um, program that you can obviously afford, even though maybe because of the educational system, sometimes you feel maybe the standard may not be up there or maybe the process may just be overall frustrating. So I just like, do you have any, shall I say, comments on this? Like, would you say um, someone should just divert and if what you can get is something local maybe a local mba then go ahead and get it does that limit your should i say opportunities going forward hmm, that's a very good question and um i don't know let me just say that there are benefits to have to having a foreign degree i would say that i benefited from that but in the situation when where one doesn't have the means, there are alternatives. There are several scholarships. There are several, several scholarships that one can tap into. Um, during my time, because I was looking at time, I didn't want to wait for the scholarship because I, I took my decision to go to school. Within six months, I got admission and I went. You know, so I didn't really have that luxury of time because in my head, I had given myself um, a schedule. Oh, do this by this time, run it by this time. And maybe I also had the luxury of having put away some funds 
because I was working while I was in, in medical school, you know. So, but not everybody has that luxury. And I would say if you, if you truly, truly want to do, go to business school and you can't afford the, the, the external, the foreign schools, maybe in Nigeria I would recommend Lagos Business School. And if it's not Lagos Business School, I would say don't go. And um, even if you don't go to business school, it doesn't mean that you can't pivot to another um, role within the healthcare space. There are several opportunities for upscaling oneself. And um, I mean, there are, there are so many resources online now where one can learn for free and build knowledge and build skills that are actually, um, uh, that, that can be put to good use. You know, there are, there are mini MBAs. There's this guy I follow on LinkedIn, for instance, that does this Techidia mini MBA where he just pays 50,000 and he gives exposure to a faculty of people who are business leaders in Nigeria. You know, that gives you really good exposure. So there are, there are things that one can do within the, your pocket size, uh, within the allowance that your pocket size gives you. You know, there are things that one can do in, in while waiting to get um, a foreign a foreign degree. And that's not to say that a foreign degree is um, all in all. I mean, at a point when you have gathered enough experience, a degree does not really matter. For me, if I were to turn back the hands of time, I would just focus a lot more on gaining certain skills while, in, while still in school and you know, putting myself in a position such that I can pivot into a non-clinical role in a company that I'm interested in, mainly after school. And then if I must go to business school, I would recommend that you have at least three to five years experience before going to business school, because I think it's, it's gonna be more beneficial. For me, I felt a lot of times while in school, I was struggling because a lot of the concepts we are so foreign I didn't have that sort of exposure in management that I have now. So if I were to go to business school now with the kind of experience I have, I think I would appreciate it even better. I would appreciate it even better. It'd be more relevant to me and I'll be able to even do a lot more with it, you know, if, if, I, if I go to business school right now. So I don't know if I was able to answer your question um, satisfactorily. Oh, Lakumi. Um, yes, yes, you did. Actually. You did. Thank you very much. Um, do we have any other questions? Okay. Maybe I can yeah. ask my second question. Oh, okay. Then after that, I think Yejide has her hands up. So after I bring Yejide, then go ahead to ask a question. Okay. Um, thank you again, Dr. Gona. So the other question I have is concerning, um, what did they call that thing? Okay. Anyways, most of the time when people travel outside of the country, there's always that decision to make that, okay, I've learned the skills. Do I go back to Nigeria, Africa and apply them? Or do I stay in a country where I can continue to have impact maybe globally and help even more people. Um, did you get to make, I mean, how did you get to make that decision? Um, is that still something you are considering? Uh, working in M Pharma, you have the opportunity to maybe go work for a multinational uh, pharmaceutical company if you want and things like that. Are you thinking about things like that and how do you make your decision? Thank you. Hi, Dr. Ogona. Oh, oh, sorry, I didn't know I was muted. So I was saying that um, at the time when I took this decision to um, go for further studies, I, I had no interest at all in living outside the country. And it was the time when the UK government had just um, the year before they had just stopped giving post-study work visas. So I knew for sure 
I wasn't interested in staying back in their country. And if I was looking to migrate, maybe I would have gone the US route or Canada or somewhere else, you know. So um, primarily for me, what I wanted was just to get the knowledge and come back. I used to be a, a big champion of Nigeria. I used to be a very big champion, even though these days <laughs> my, my um, what would you call it, uh, my faith, you know, has taken a hit by recent events. But I was always a champion of get the knowledge, come back, do something here. Because the truth is, the same way we have problems here, all these problems that we have in the healthcare industry, the lack of insurance, the poor access to healthcare, the lack of doctors, you know, the, the poor, um, poor awareness of the population when it comes to health, um, um, health matters, poor awareness and poor knowledge. They are all opportunities. They are all opportunities. Wherever there's a problem, there's an opportunity to solve that problem. So that was the kind of mindset that I had coming back. I saw it as an opportunity to come back and find a way either start a company or work with a company that is innovative and that will come up with ideas to tackle the problems that we have on ground. And so, yes, um, I know that eventually one day I would leave M Pharma. And to be honest, I haven't really thought about where next um, I'm heading to. And that's because some of the things that we're currently working on, they're still quite young. So I haven't gotten to the stage of I'm going to say plateau. We're still like on the on the rise, you know, coming up with all these initiatives, rolling them out, growing them, introducing them to the market, getting them to be adopted, you know. So um, there's still a lot of um, how would I say? There's still a lot of stimulation. There's still a lot of um, creativity that needs to go into the job, you know, setting up processes, how this program will run, building a program, designing a program, rolling it out. So it's still quite exciting for me. I haven't really thought about moving on. And eventually when I do move on, you are right. I mean, working with them pharma, I've partnered with um, lots of um, players in the pharma industry, the global pharma industry. So it does put me on that sort of advantage where with my experience, it's easier to pivot into a role within those former companies. But truth be told, um, it's not something I really look forward to because I see a lot of those companies as, um, you know, these companies have been there for, some of them have been there for decades and decades. So they are like behemoths, they are huge, they're massive, and they are set in their ways. So I see them as places where it's difficult sometimes to, make an impact, you know, in within M Pharma, it's easier to build something from scratch, get, you know, get the approvals that you need to run with it and actually roll it out and see the impact of what you are doing. So that's the fulfillment that I get from it. So maybe, maybe when I'm done with M Pharma, who knows, I might actually head to another startup as well. You know, just the adrenaline rush of it, or maybe when I'm much older, I might move to something a bit more predictable, more predictable day-to-day -day, um, activity job. All right. Thank you so much for that answer, Dr. Ogona. You're welcome, Ibrahim. Um, all right. Thank you, Dr. Ogona. Yeah, today, um, I think you can go ahead to ask your question. Okay, thank you, Kumi. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Dr. Obina. Um, so I don't know if this is a question or it's a comment, but um, I, I'll just first like to say thank you very much for sharing. It was quite insightful for me. And at a point when you were talking, I just I was just laughing and I was consoled at the same time. Especially when you said that even after going to um, business school and you came back when you started working, you were still searching for something. You, you knew that you had not yet found it and it was not as if you had all the, um, you had it together at that point. So that was quite concerning for me because currently I'm at the point where I know that I don't want to do clinical medicine. Like that I'm sure. But 
on the other hand, I really do not know the exact place. So I'm at a point where there are a lot of things calling my attention. I like health systems. I like advocacy too. So I would want to ask that, is there any, any tips that you can give a confused, <laughs> a confused doctor that, um, was there anything that actually helped you to um, make up your mind about what you're doing currently? And then do you still see yourself thinking about other aspects apart from clinical role now? Do you still see yourself thinking about other aspects of um, um, the health system that you, you, are, you might be interested in? Yeah, you did. Uh, that's a very good question from you. And honestly, I can relate with how you feel. Honestly, I can relate with how you feel because even at this stage, everybody at some point has self-doubts of, okay, what's the next thing? Oh, this role, can I even do it? You know, you know you're looking at some um, job roles, you're looking at vacancies, and you're seeing everything that they are asking for, you're wondering, you start asking yourself questions, can I do this? You know? So um, what I would say, my tip for you, I, I think I wish, the only thing I wish back then is, I wish I had like a real mentor you know, it's also somebody that you can, you know, bounce ideas with that will help put you on the right track. It's okay to not know what you want. I mean, it's great if you know exactly what you want. It's really great because then you can focus and, you know, work towards it. But if you don't know what you want, it's okay. And but if you know what you don't want, and that's really good. So at least stay away from what you don't want. What I would say is, Try and find the things that interest you because for me, if a job, if you're not passionate about what you end up doing, then it's going to be a big bore for you and you will not put in your best. You're likely not to rise fast because you're not putting in your best and you just wake up in the morning, you won't be happy going to work. You know, so what I would say, try to find people in the spaces that you're interested in. If you're interested in health policy, for instance, find people in that space who can, you know, we can leverage on their knowledge and their experience. I mean, I know almost all of us here were probably on Facebook, but how many of us are on LinkedIn? How many of us are active on LinkedIn? You know, go on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is a very good resource. Um, create your profile, optimize your profile, type health policy into the search box, try to find professionals who are in that space. Go to their profiles, what have they done? What are the things that they've done that you can do? Some of them write blogs, some of them write stuff from Medium, some write directly on LinkedIn. You can read articles that they've written, you know, and try to gain some knowledge. And, you know, this is sort of a proxy exposure to what, what it probably is like being in their, in their field. And it helps you to decide, is it really what I want to do? Is it really what I want to do or do I want to try something else? And I mean, on LinkedIn, you come across everybody and anybody and there's a lot of exposure that you can get from that. So that's my one advice. Everybody get on LinkedIn, look around, see what people are doing. You, you, you can get a lot of um, creative ideas from what other people are doing and you can get inspired to do also to also do better. Of course, don't forget that a lot of what you see on social media can be... Um, how do you call it? Um, I can't remember the English word for it, but you know what we call wash. So you also have to be careful such that you now don't get, a lot of people put all sorts of achievements on LinkedIn. You also need to be careful such that you don't, um, you don't get intimidated and start having self doubts because you think you're not doing enough. So that balance has to be there. I don't know if I've gone off track or if I've been able to answer your question. If I didn't answer your question, ask your question again. I think I must have gone off track. So you did. You did. <laughs> okay. You did. Thank you so much. Yeah. And also feel free to reach out to people on LinkedIn. Reach out to people. People always um, some might not respond to you, but some will. Uh, I think Ola Kumi reached out to me on LinkedIn. That was how we got. Yes. That was how we
Okay, in the first place. So it's actually a very great resource. Reach out to people in the space you're interested in. You just never know. Tell them, oh, um, I'm interested in this. And make meaningful conversation. Don't just reach out to somebody in the DM and just say, hello, how was your day? You know, you just go. That sort of thing is, nobody has time for that. So you can just draft a nice DM. Oh, um, hello, ma. Um, so, so, and so person. I'm interested in this. I saw that you are in this career space and it's something I'm really interested in. You know, I like your write-ups, um, especially, you know, just interest them. Show them they are actually interested. Strike up a conversation and then let it go from there. Don't pester them. And you just never know. Just also let them know I'm open to job opportunities within this space. So if you ever have anything within your company, please do let me know. And whether you, you know it or not, somehow you've made an impression and it's at the back of their mind. So go out there, nothing can happen. What's the worst that will happen? You send a DM, they won't respond to you. That's the very worst that can happen. That's the worst, nothing else can happen. Even if you are the shyest person on earth, nobody's looking at your face when you're sending DMs. So feel free, go there, type. You know, network, meet other people in the in the field that you're interested in. And people tell their career stories, how they got into what they are doing. People put up job opportunities and stuff. And you are able to, you are going to be able to tap into these things if you're in the right place at the right time and connected to the right people. And of course, don't forget the power of um, networking. I keep saying it. All the jobs I got. I didn't get them from seeing an advert on, online. Somebody always sends the adverts to me and then I applied. So if you are connected to the right people who know what you want, they will always have you in mind when they see something that looks good, uh, that looks right for you. They will always push it to your way. Thank you very much. That was quite okay. Welcome. You're welcome here today. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Oguna. It's actually been a very interesting and insightful session. Um, I don't know if anybody has any question. We probably could have time for one more question before we end this session. So is there any other person with any question? And preferably on mute and ask the question so that I can have it. All right. I guess there is no other question. So um, if there is no other question, I think we've come to the end of today's session with Dr. Oguna. Thank you very much for your story. And then I think we also got an insight into what M Pharma is about. So thank you very much. Um, and thank you to everyone that has attended as well. Dr. Gona share that um, LinkedIn profile in the chat box. So if you're interested in um, connecting with her after this, you can always reach out to her. And as she said, I connected with her via LinkedIn as well. I think that was after house job and we've been talking since then. So she's actually very open. So um, yes. This session was recorded, so um, we'll also send out the recording at the end of the session. Thank you, Lakumi. Uh, big thanks. This is something that um, this is an initiative that um, I identify very much with because I know that it's something that would help people who are in the same kind of position that I was many years back. Um, so I think it's a very good initiative from you and I'd like to say well done and keep it up. And thanks to everyone also who um, spent time here to be part of the session. Thank you very much and um, have a great uh, weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.